All right, and welcome to Fast Break Breakfast NBA Podcast. My name is Keith. Later in the episode, we have Dan Favalli coming on, also Christian Clark to talk about his David Griffin Pelicans article. But right now, I'm joined by John Burr. John, how's it going? Good. We're here to talk about Andrew Wiggins' shot selection or what? What's, what's no, the topic man, du jour? I know. In a little bit. We'll get to it. I don't, you know, the vaccination that's it, that's, that's jokes. That's all I got. <laughs> the vaccination jokes are so easy and so enticing. And, like, I felt like I did so many of them in the bubble yeah. like a year and a half ago. And now I'm like, I guess we still, we're still supposed to keep doing them. Like we're still supposed to keep doing them. Well, you can't take the hack out of, out of, you know, someone's been doing it this long, Keith. That's right. Yeah. Uh, no, let's, keep chopping wood. Let's focus not on Andrew Wiggins, but his previous team, the Minnesota Timberwolves. Who is it weird that in my head, like he's a Timberwolf for life just because he's such like a, you, you can a get goofy, the nightmarish You can character. get the, the Wiggins out of, Minnesota, but you can't get right. to Minnesota. I don't know. Um, They're still wigging it. The Timberwolves surprisingly let go of their GM, Gerson Rosas, uh, just a few days before training camp. All of the NBA has basically been waiting on pins and needles for news of the Timberwolves to swing a big deal to acquire Ben Simmons. But the Woj bomb we got was that he'd been fired. And then it came out. As these things do. So let me ask a question first. Okay, go ahead. Is this already the Mandela effect, or have I already uh, falsely learned that Gerson was fired after being seen kissing a staff person on the Jumbotron, or is that a yeah, meme that, that has been that's Mandela? What, that's what they're saying now. That's <laughs> what they're saying now is he was he was kissing someone at a – at a MLS game, at a Minnesota MLS game, and uh, or they called a match. I don't know. Uh, and, it's in the U.S. It's a game, and th- thus was outed. I don't know if he was trying to hide it, but mm-hmm. apparently they thought that was some untoward inter-office relationship. And then the rumblings, as they always do, you never know if they're true because they only come out after the fact, saying like, "Oh, relationships were strained, and no one knew, you know, what what kind of job he was doing." So this then, reminds me of uh, our missing cast member, our missing podcast member. Yeah. Who, it's easy to label Chuck as a ne'er-do-well. It's easy to to say that Chuck hasn't gotten all that he strove for in life. <laughs> but I think there's actually a subtle perfection to what Chuck has done over the course of his life. Because he knows that if he becomes successful or famous, it's only a matter of time before it's all undone at a sporting event on a kiss cam. So, so he just he just keeps it he keeps it at his at his preferred level where all the all the all the uh all the misdeeds can just can just exist peacefully. So now the Timberwolves <laughs> they lose. I mean they they they, they promote it from within. Um I don't know how to pronounce is is it Sachin? Sachin Gupta is is promoted. He's someone who's thought well of around the league. He, the inventor now, of the trade machine, your uh, Gumar. That's been claimed. There's also <laughs> those out there who believe Real GM had the first trade machine. Mm. So I don't know who's their true originalist. I don't want to stake a claim here in, in this online battle. I think Henry Abbott needs to throw his uh, hairless yeah, ring in there. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, Gupta will be the first person of Indian origin to run a NBA team's basketball operations. This uh, is probably racist, but I thought Bob Volgaris was Indian. I guess not Pakistani or something like that. I don't know uh, what is his uh, nationality. I do know Gotta he's decided do better, to John. leave. Yeah. Uh, he's decided to leave his position with the Dallas so Mavericks. So much stuff today. So much. St- all of it's on Twitter. <laughs> so much of it in like the weird NBA uh, faction. I don't know. The weird NBA storylines of just kind of random guys. It did lead to an unbelievable moment where Sham Sharania lets out the news that um, lack of performance is the reason Rosas is being let go. And he was not referring to the affair with the lack of performance. It was unrelated. But guys, low T. If you're experiencing a lack of performance, use code Rosas <laughs> at bluechew.com. <laughs> yeah. For 20% off your discreet first 
order. No, it's a strange situation. Also, you have the impending ownership change. We don't know how much of this is Alec Rodriguez and Mark Laurie coming in. Apparently, they interviewed around. They got to lay the land. They're like, you know, let's get rid of this guy. But Glenn Taylor, the outgoing owner, who still has control of the team for the next year, like he's the one who has to make the firing. The PR release about the firing misspelled Timberwolves. Beautiful. They also, uh, they announced the firing and in a PR email. And then like 20 minutes later, announced the new hiring in a PR email. Is there a reason, John, do you know, is there a PR reason those weren't both the same email? It seemed like they if have- they knew this was going to happen, just do it all at once and say, we have a replacement. Not, I don't know. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Also, Carl Anthony Towns tweeted out WTF. Yeah. Uh, so he was kind just a of big, shocked. Just a big Mark Marin fan. Just a big Mark Marin fan. That's right. Shut the gates. Uh, <laughs> lock the gates. Excuse me. Uh, the uh, just a strange situation. And we can now let's get to Andrew Wiggins. Andrew Wiggins has now possibly stated he originally stated he wouldn't get vaccinated unless he was forced to. Okay. Now he's been. You could argue he's forced been to. forced to. Because he won't be allowed to play home games unless he gets vaccinated. And he said he's not going to. How does this affect my fantasy roster, John? Do I not? Is this do not draft? Andrew Wiggins is now do not draft? I would say unless you're talking eye shop, you shouldn't have been drafting Wiggins anyways. So I'm a late round pick. (laughs) I mean, any guy who can get get some of those steals. He can get me a steal and a block (laughs) and 18 points. I'm in. But yeah, yeah, uh, if he's going to miss California games. Well, first of all, if he's going to miss California games, that ostensibly means I will never see him play this year. So I'm kind of thrilled about this because <laughs> uh, I endured an entire year of Andrew Wiggins at the University of Kansas when he was supposed to be the best player in the country. And it was brutal then. So, uh, I mean, this is just more of the same for 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 Wiggins, like career filled with folly. He had such a promising kind of rebound last year. I mean, playing yeah. alongside Steph Curry and Draymond Green, just a, a, a wonderful salve to yeah. a underwhelming career. And it seemed like the Warriors are poised to do really good things. If Wiggins isn't available, now it's all about like, oh my goodness, can Otto Porter play 40 games? What are the conversations between Draymond Green and Andrew Wiggins like right now? Wow. I have Those no are idea. some terse texts. Yeah, I'm imagining a lot of bras. <laughs> it's not it's not a great situation. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what you're supposed to do. It's just a weird situation for the whole league. Well, have, you, obviously. have you had this in your friend group at all? Vaccine like hesitation? An, any anti-vaxxers? No. So I've had one. OK. And he just is just slowly. Kind of like first a text thread was created sans person. Yeah, like the old text thread where we shared all our like Star Trek memes. <laughs> you know, a, a, yeah. a text a text thread that's longer than Andrew Wiggins' career. We slowly had to start a second thread, just sans person. Yeah, and then like now a guy who I used to text with, you know, interact with, think of all the t- like almost daily is now just kind of until this conversation. I don't think I had thought of him in over a month. Yeah, that's so. So is Wiggins getting kicked out of all the uh, the group me's the, the Fortnite uh, groups? Oh man, that's just, a big deal now. Yep. Well, if you are looking to not draft Andrew Wiggins in fantasy, you can come play fantasy basketball with us. We're doing our fantasy basketball signups right now. We have our regular head to head category leagues, and also the negative. Fantasy League, the International Stackhouse of Pancakes, negative fantasy league. I don't know if you can drive. If Wiggins is missing games, you can't take them. But if you want to play fantasy with us, you do that at patreon.com slash fast break breakfast. You got to be at the $5 tier. That also gets you in our Slack chat. That gets you access to our monthly bonus Zoom Hangout where we answer your questions uh, in a little Zoom setting. And then you can check out that video if you can't make it live. But if you want to play fantasy basketball with us, you can support the show at patreon.com slash fast break breakfast. Well, John, enjoy talking with you and I will see you next week. Watch out for those kiss cams, brother.
I'm joined right now by Dan Favale from Bleacher Report and Hardwood Knox Podcast and NBA Math. Dan, how's it going? I am doing well, Keith. How are you doing? I am doing great. I asked you to come on. I thought the format we could use for this episode is just name the three teams that you consider to be the most mysterious. I didn't give you any parameters. And I'll tell you the way I'm going to think about doing it is like the team where I, I'm like, I feel like they could finish really high in their conference or maybe really, really low. I don't know what we're going to see from them, but please use whatever, whatever, you know, rubric you decide to use. But before we get there, as you know, we do start off each episode talking about your breakfast. Uh, have you had a good breakfast today or recently? Uh, not today. You would think I would have done better than just pounding an energy drink when I got up knowing I was coming on this podcast. But uh, I did have some stuffed French toast and Ooh. eggs Benedict a few days ago at brunch. So maybe I'm just still full or all breakfasted up from that. What was, what was the French toast stuffed with? Um, it was stuffed with like this Nutella cream cheese Ooh. type of mix. It was delicious. Um, I highly recommend people try it if they see it anywhere that has, has it on the menu or if they can make it themselves at home. That's, I mean, coming from someone with a sweet tooth, that's a lot. It was a lot, but it was totally worth it. An experience totally it. that I would 10 of 10 recommend. Yeah, that sounds, that does sound incredible. I would definitely order that. Well, without further ado, let's do this mysterious team thing. I know you, you cover the whole NBA on your podcast and, and the stuff you write. Um, what's a team out there that you consider to be mysterious for this upcoming season? Yeah, I think I might have done it a little differently than you, where I'm just, I pick teams that they could be really good. I'm just not sure what they are, though, yeah. overall. And so the first thing that springs to mind is the Toronto Raptors, who I think are going to end up being really good unless they end unless they're sellers, but the lack of people who think that they're going to be really good is making me think that I shouldn't think they're going to be really good. And I look at the roster and I'm trying to figure out how much Scotty Barnes is going to play. I'm trying to figure out if they have enough shot creation, if Guan Dragic is going to finish the season there. I thought Pascal Siakam is coming off an underrated season for what he did, but what is he going to look like this year? They're so deep, and yet I simultaneously have questions about their offense. Are we going to get an offensive lead from OG Ananobi? I just think overall they could end up being a real defensive terror, but there seems to be a high variance in their outcomes because just based off what happened this off season and knowing that Masai really hasn't gotten the chance to do like a full on reset, I could totally see this team like sort of pivoting very much into the bigger picture. If it's clear that they're not in like the top four or five of the East. So you use your own process to come up with your teams. I also, I had the Raptors as one. Cause I mean, I, what are we going to get from the Raptors on paper? They look awesome. Like they had right. a horrible year last year. Everyone knows they were living out of a hotel for the entire season. They were banned from Canada for over 12 months. And this team still has all these really talented guys from their deep playoff runs, from their championship season. You look at these recent top 100 lists that were put out. Fred Van Vliet's really, really high on them. Yeah. And so you're like, this team is deep, like top to bottom. They have some questions, I guess, the center, but like Kim Birch and uh, Chris Boucher are, are kind of fun. And then if Scotty Barnes gives them anything, it seems like if there was one team that we could say, like, who's someone no one's talking about that could finish top four in the East? For me, it's the Raptors. But like you said, no one else is talking about them. Like they're, they're projected to be, like not even in the play in for most people when they're listening to their top <laughs> 10 East teams. And I'm like, what's going on? Is it that these GMs have this weird fetish for, for tanking? Like Masai's like, yeah, yeah, I really never got a, re a tear down. Uh, I thought I was promised a tear down. I want to, I want to lose some games for fun. Yeah. And I think we saw it this year where it's like, they're not going to be the team that finishes seven or 10. Like if they're just clearly not in the upper echelon, which you can't guarantee that they will because there's the nets, the bucks and pretty much everyone else, but everyone else is, almost literally everyone else aside from Cleveland and Orlando, like Miami, Boston, the Knicks, Atlanta, like that list goes on. And so they could theoretically for, fall outside that top four or five. And then you have to sort of hedge against, well, Masai is definitely going to sell, sell players or is he going to just sit everyone again? Like the uh, Raptors did towards the end of last year. So as long as Chris Boucher plays a ton of minutes and stays healthy, I will be entertained no matter what the Raptors are doing. But <laughs> I feel the life of me, can't really figure out what they're going to wind up being. It just seems like they have a, you know, per your criteria, an extremely high ceiling and underrated and understatedly high ceiling, but their floor by design could also be pretty low. 
Yeah, so I, I I didn't tell you to rank them or anything, but like I had this as my second most mysterious team. But as we talk about it, perhaps they are the most mysterious because we literally have no idea what they're going to show us. I feel like if they roll out, if they roll out Fred Van Vliet, Gary Trent Jr. with OG and Pascal and essentially anybody, I mean, like that's, really good team. that's like a good team. And it seems like they could be unbelievably good at defense. Like if Scotty Barnes gives you anything, like what if Scotty Barnes is – what if he shows up a little more developed than like Jonathan Isaac did? And then they add just another guy with like a high variance, I guess, like a lot of skills. We don't know what his games look like. Maybe he'll be very raw offensively, but you have dudes who can shoot and score already on the team. He could just slide in and, you know, like learn how to get rebounds, learn how to get steals blocks. And it seems like he could be a perfect glue guy. Like this team is enticing and yet Maybe they want right. to lose. It's like, or maybe they just want to lose, and it's so weird. And yeah, because there is there's lineup data too from last year that just support like they obliterated in certain combinations opponents when Kyle Lowry and Norman Powell, who was traded midseason, weren't there. And it's like this isn't just we're stepping out on a whim. There is statistical evidence to suggest that this team can outperform opponents with a lot of their current core. And if you add anything from Scotty Barnes, what if just Goran Dragic stays there and is healthy? Like that's yeah. he's a drop off from Kyle Lowry. But offensively, how much of a drop off? Probably not super stark, at least. So the Raptors were terrible last year when Lowry played. Like it's like yeah. a really, it's like a really weird, even if you ignore the end of the season tanking, it's like if you look, I can't remember what it was, like the first 40 games that he played in, they had an awful record. I think they won like the first eight games that he set out last year. It was like a very strange. Like, what do you what do you take from that? Was that just a random? Uh, is that noise? What are the NBA math folks' official stance on why the Raptors struggled uh, with Lowry last year? I think it was so Pascal Siakam did not get off to a great start last yeah. year. And then yeah. just they were the team at large was just so impacted by injuries or or COVID, what, whatever it was, that I just felt like that Tampa was sort of yeah, the, yeah, Tampa. That's the and I mean you mentioned at the top, but like every game was a road game for them. They were just completely thrown uh, out of their element for that. And so if you go just factor in like let's just say they get all of their home games this year how many extra games did they just win by default because they're not playing in tampa this year yeah it seems like it'd be it seems like it'd be a ton um let's move to another team uh since we overlapped there i've got a few extras but let's go ahead and hear your next team we'll see if we overlap again yeah i have the new orleans pelicans who i actually don't think that they can be really good yet maybe zion goes kaboom and i'm not even just picking them because of the the david griffin piece that recently came out, although that does make them probably more mysterious at what's going to happen at this point. But if you look at their off-season transactions, just everything that they did, the players in, the players out, the picks out, the contracts they gave out, like even just guaranteeing two years of Garrett Temple's three-year deal, they might, the pieces might make more sense, but you went through, you waited through a lot of stuff. And I don't think you can guarantee that you're going to actually be better And that's sort of mind boggling to me where you look at them and you say their path to being better is just that Zion and Brandon Ingram really continue to improve. And maybe the non, the non Zion minutes, I do think got better when you have Jonas Valanciunas and assuming Devontae Graham is more 2019, 20 Devontae Graham than 2020, 21, but there's still variants there. Like he just wasn't great last year. And what is this team going to be on defense? I think they somehow might've gotten a little worse on defense, which is saying something, I guess you do have Trey Murphy coming in. Naj Marsh will play more minutes. Um, Josh Hart is back. I'm so confused by what the Pelicans are doing. It feels like they, they traveled 80 miles to go nowhere, essentially. Oh yeah. I like that. That's very well said. Well, this is incredible synergy, synergy, Dan, because uh, Christian Clark, who wrote that David Griffin piece actually appears on this episode. That we're on right now. You had no I'm way of knowing that. So I can't the, wait to listen to that segment. So the, the Pelicans are interesting. I don't have them as a mysterious team based on how I was thinking, because like you said, I don't expect a lot from them. Like I, I would be, I would be stunned if they finished sixth or higher in the West. In my mind, yeah. they're essentially like seventh to 11th. And if I guess the wheels fall off 12th or 13th, but like, I, I feel like I have them pegged for some of those reasons you said, on paper, they look like they got worse at defense and they were terrible at defense. So maybe the coaching staff, the changeover, that that will help. I do think there's always intrigue around Zion because he's one of the most exciting players in the league. He's obviously tantalizing and there's still all these questions about his health and even his buy-in for, for like, you know, like how committed he is to the Pelicans and winning basketball games. 
Yeah, and I think that's the reason I'm inclined. I think they actually probably have a lower floor than people give them credit for, which is why they are tantalizing <laughs> if it, you know the yeah. car crash theory. But sure. because of because of Zion, I think that there's a pathway to them just being top six. He was, you know, has he been out of shape? Has he been injured? But yet he's still just going to average like you know, essentially like thirty and five and yeah. have the best second jump in the NBA. And they could just be. Are they ever going to give up? Like, how many offensive rebounds are they going to grab with him and Jonas Valanciunas on the floor? So I'm trying to. I'm just. I'm so high on Zion that I'm like, they probably just could be better than I'm giving them credit, but we're not talking enough about if the wheels sort of fall off this team, couldn't they kind of be in like that? No, they're not the Rockets or the Thunder, but can you guarantee me a third team in the West that's going to be worse than them? I don't know that you can at this point. Yeah, and you also would have, you know, you'd have David Griffin, embattled GM on his third coach in three years. Will they even feel like permission to bottom out like if things are going so poorly for the first half of the season is there a a stomach for tanking all the way to the bottom because then like whatever these rumors are about zion now that's going to be amplified even more and it just be it'd be kind of a nightmare situation so that's it's a tough spot the pelicans are in um what's what's another team what's your final team uh that you listed as being a mysterious team I, I struggled between to pick these two and this is also inadvertently top by went with the Timberwolves and this has very little to do the, again, the car crash theory with Gerson Rosas, everything happening there. But even beforehand, it was like, okay, you look at, they didn't do much this off season. You add Patrick Beverly, bring back Jordan McLaughlin, Jared Vanderbilt just gave up on Jared Culver. What, what are they uh, at full strength? A lot of their pieces make sense together. You know, their, their core of Jaden McDaniels, Towns, Malik Beasley, D'Lo being there. Anthony Edwards was just so good towards the end of um, the season and even showed like got a little bit better off ball defensively. Can they sort of party crash like the play in or that bottom, you know, that last playoff uh, seed discussion? I would hedge no. Could they also be worse than expected? Um, now, given what's happened, like is just something weird going to go on with with Carl Anthony Towns here? Are they a team that's going to make a big move? They're just so linked, ingrained into that Ben Simmons discourse at the moment. And if they're willing to give up D'Lo, who is admittedly one of Cat's best friends, like what do those talks become? And so I think I'm projecting there a little bit for them. And I was also thinking the team that I didn't pick, I was assuming you were going to pick. So I was like, let me just try and Ooh. veer away from this so that so that we're not overlapping too much. Sure. No, the, the Timberwolves are, I, I had them high on my, like even if no Ben Simmons trade happens, I have them high on, perhaps my, my league pass ranking, my subjective like team I'm very interested in watching. I do not expect them to be any good. Like I'm hoping there is a Carl Anthony Towns bounce back and he like forces himself back into the conversation where people mention Jokic and Embiid and Towns is like some of the best centers. Like he's been totally left behind in that conversation. Now it's almost comical, you know, to, to even consider like two years ago, a lot of people argued Cat was better than those guys. And he, he's obviously... Hasn't had the success on the court. He had a tough year on the court and off the court last season. But I'd like to see him bounce back. But just for sheer entertainment value, I think the rotation of their guards, like, I don't like D'Angelo Russell, but Patrick Beverly, eh, he's kind of fun to watch. But the combination with those guys, with Malik Beasley, with um, Anthony Edwards, that at least is firepower. And that is, you give Chris Finch a chance to, to, to really maybe have an offseason work with those guys, where it does seem like, at the very least, this could be like a high-scoring, potent, fun-to-watch team. The guys you mentioned, Jaden McDaniels, I like, I, I'm kind of really super enamored with him. And even like Jared Vanderbilt is kind of fun. I think he might be Human energy drink. Yeah, yeah. They, they they might be asking too much of him if he's like gonna start. But I do think you know you throw in defensive guy like a Kogi with Vanderbilt, and then whatever Jaden McDaniels comes, that they're a very interesting team. I don't personally write them as mysterious. Because again, like I'm pretty low on even best case scenario that I feel like I, I imagine, I don't see them overcoming most of like the teams I'm like the top seven teams. Like I'd be stunned if like they catch a healthy Grizzlies team, and that's not even a high bar, you know. Like I think the Grizzlies <laughs> ceiling is like is like seventh essentially, and so like I'd be really surprised if they have enough talent to even like catch Memphis, which is why maybe I find them a little less uh, mysterious. I would put them closer to the very bottom of the West than not. I think yeah. the projecting of the, what could they do on the transaction market is why I'm so drawn to them because if they did go, yeah. Simmons, and 
look, maybe the line of thinking changes a little bit with Rosas out of there, but they've been obsessed with kind of finding a frontline partner for Towns since forever and just haven't been able to find one. So even if it's not Ben Simmons, if another name just becomes available, like this just feels like a team that might make an all-in play, even though they're technically not good enough to do it. And I I want to see how the Carl Anthony Towns discourse develop develops. I'm not saying, oh, is he going to request a trade? But, you know, right after this Rosa stuff, there's a poll on Twitter. Would you rather have Cat or Tom Thibodeau? The fact that we're there and that wasn't a sarcastic poll. It's just like, how what? off the rails is the Carl Anthony Towns discourse? It was from a Knicks blog. I think it was posting and toasting has it up there but like okay. that was very would you rather have brad stevens or Giannis? like right, that was right, just right. a carbon copy of that and so now i'm like oh do people are they lower on carl Anthony towns than than i even thought like i look at that guy as just like a bona fide superstar and if the wolves are losing again or if their season is kind of veering off any sort of positive path like what does that talk become like and again maybe i'm just like negativity is a magnet and so maybe i'm just <laughs> like a moth to a flame with it yeah it seems like they got to get some kind of front court pairing for cat that makes sense i kind of was hoping they would this is not like a big swing this is the most minor of swings i felt like they really needed to do a a, a gorgy jang reunion i feel like they missed the boat on that i feel like it would have been a very cheap just nice decent backup center and a guy that you could honestly play at the same time as cat like nas reed He's fun to watch, but I can't handle people saying he's good. Like, he's not. I don't think he's any good. You can't really play. I like him. You just can't play him with Towns. And no. You kind, of, you kind of touched on another point. For a team that wanted a sub-25 win pace, whatever it was last year, they did very little over the offseason. Like that Incredibly type, little. That type of stasis is reserved for teams that are actually good or have a clear-cut direction. They are not. They have neither. Like, they're not they, good. They're they, they got rid of Rubio, and they replaced him with – Tory, uh, Patrick Prince? Beverly and like you and gave Patrick up Patrick Beverly. Cobra. It's like, eh. it's, it's semi significant, but their first move didn't even come until like the, I mean, there was the Rubio stuff before the draft, but after that, their next moves just came so far into the off season, which leads me to believe. And I'm thinking organizationally, this wasn't just a girls on Rosas thing is that they're on the prowl for a bigger swing. And so I'm just like, if there's a team that shouldn't make another big move, but is going to, <laughs> I'm picking the Timberwolves. <laughs> it's either them or the Kings uh, for the big move, but should not. Well, I mean, can you even imagine th what a trade would be? Because this is where I get hung up. If it, if truly D'Angelo Russell's not going out, there's not anything that makes sense to me as far as something that the Sixers would do. Like, do they wait? Like, how long do they have to wait to package Torian Prince in something? Like, you know, like, I don't know how they even match the salary, and I don't even know how any of it is remotely appealing to the Sixers. Look, I think if Wednesday proves anything, it's that having future Timberwolves picks is probably a good idea at this point if your other teams <laughs> bet against their future. Yeah. And I think for Philly specifically, that's not a huge interest, but maybe at some point in the middle of the season, a third team comes along, a fourth team comes along, and if Minnesota's just willing to send out a bunch of future draft picks in addition to the Malik Beasley and Jaden McDaniels as sort of the core assets maybe even Patrick Beverly at that point I don't know right perhaps there's more of a path to getting something done but I think it's critical that you need a team that's not Philly who really values Minnesota's future draft equity and I actually you know if I'm a team that's going to be rebuilding or wants future draft equity give me all the Timberwolves future draft equity at this point I, I don't trust them at all to do what's right yeah I don't know how anybody would uh who's the team that you felt like you were saving for me the Chicago Bulls I thought we're oh. the low hanging fruit here. I mean, you, if I you, know, if I, I, if I, I like told you they were fourth in yeah. the East, would you flinch? But if I told you they were 12th, would you also flinch? So that, so that I, I agree with you there. I think they're, they're one team where I, I think that there's a really, there's a really big variance. They're, they're another team that I'm incredibly excited to watch next year. I think they could be so fun, but also like I'm more, I'm more lower on them. I think they're, more likely going to be like a seven or eight or nine seed. I think it was Chris Herring who was talking recently about how he thought they were going to be very, very good. And I was like, I don't see it. Chris is smart. So like, may, may, like maybe they will turn out really good. I'll tell you what, here's, here's my most mysterious team. My most mysterious team. I, I, I kind of stumbled upon this decision doing our Western conference preview earlier this week. I think the San Antonio Spurs, I have no concept of who, who's going to start for them. I have no concept. Like it, maybe they will be terrible. Maybe pop will just kind of coast and be like, let's get a high draft pick. But when I look at them, when I'm assembling their team on paper, a lot of the pieces make a lot of sense to me. And I think they could be really frisky. I think they could actually have a good defense in San Antonio. And I think 
pop is a great offensive coach. Like it could, that, that side of the ball maybe takes care of itself, but if it's Derek white, DeJounte Murray, and then Keldon Johnson, and then like, is Thad young going to stay and play on the Spurs? I love that with, with Pirtle at the five, like that five man unit, I think is really cool. I think Alfred Camino could bounce back. Like Bren forms is a fine depth piece. Like, I think they're an interesting team that no one is projecting to make the play in. And I think the West is going to be, is going to be pretty tough to make that play in. I don't think it's as good as the East this year, but still for the team, like the Kings or the Timberwolves or the Spurs to overcome, I think the guys ahead of them, it might be a little bit difficult, but the, the Spurs to me are this like unknowable mystery where I don't know what in the world they're going to look like uh, when the season opens. Yeah. Maybe I'm, that's a great point. And maybe I'm just, I'm just assuming Thaddeus Young finishes the season somewhere else. Right. Um, But to your point, like we still don't even know what it's very clearly seems like, okay, they're ready to give the keys of the offense to DeJounte Murray after having it in DeMar DeRozan's hands for a while. We still don't know what Murray and white can really be together. We haven't seen that. Uh, And then, I just assumed they were rebuilding because of how they handled the Mar DeRozan situation. But was that just, you know, a matter of opportunity because the Bulls offered this huge contract and were willing to break bread via sign and trade? And this was like, yeah, all right, we'll we'll join this. Uh, they did pay Doug McDermott, who if you're going to overpay shooting, fine. But like, he doesn't really align with a team that should be rebuilding. And how much are they going to rely on their actual youngsters if they have, you know, Thaddeus Young, Deshante Murray, Derek White there? There's... You know, what does Devin Vassell get to do in year two? I'm even looking at Josh Primo, who played a lot of point guard in summer league. And normally I'd say, oh, the Spurs aren't going to play a rookie. But it's like, they really just traded away their top two point guard or not, but their Patty Mills and DeMar DeRozan are gone. Like there is a vacuum for playmaking there after you have, there's DeJounte Murray and then there's Derek White, but there's minutes to go around now. As summer a, as league a stud Trey Jones. He was so good too. Yeah, he was really good. Yeah, so like the, the McDermott thing, I even like it doesn't bug me. That's just like in my mind, I assume I I would leave him like maybe he starts. Maybe Kelton Johnson is at the four if like Thad Young's not a big part of the plans, but just him being in the rotation and like we say, all right, they lost DeMar DeRozan, they lost Rudy Gay, they lost Patty Mills. I think if you replace all those minutes theoretically with more Kelton Johnson, with a healthy Derek White, a healthy DeJounte Murray, with is it v- Vassell and Aminu and McDermott? I don't think there's a big talent drop up there, honestly. I think maybe the fit is better, and I think the defense could possibly be way better. But if I talk myself into a Spurs frenzy, yeah, they might buy out Thad Young for all we know. You know, like you, you, hopefully he has some trade value, but it's just, I don't know what the Spurs are going to do. I personally don't think, you know, I'm not even including Primo. I'm just guessing he doesn't actually play. Um, maybe they still have Lonnie Walker minutes, which aren't always the best, but you know, he's good for a fun dunk every now and then. There's just so many guys where I'm like, I kind of like that guy. I kind of like that guy. And if, you know, if Kelton Johnson gets better, if Devin Vassell gets better, this team could be like really tough to play. And so that's where I like, I'm like, I kind of throw my hands up and say, I don't know what they're going to be. Yeah. I mean, Patty Mills was not good for them down the stretch of last year for the most part. And so, so you're right there. And I think actually the Doug McDermott contract might be the perfect encapsulation of their off season where that's a move you make if you're trying to win, but it's also not a move that you make if you're not trying to win that really informs anything about your direction. And so it is hard to figure out what the Spurs are doing. And you already sort of alluded to this is just the age of Greg Popovich and the fact that he's just still there. Does that imply they're not willing to plan for the future and that they're going for it? Or is he just open to, you know, let's just, let's really steer into this. We'll trade Thad Young eventually, and this is going to be a developmental year. And then I didn't even really give consideration to Aminu, but it's like, yeah, if he's healthy and the knees are fine, that's a guy who's a really good defender. <laughs> right. Like I, like, I have no intelligence or news about the health of Alfred Aminu. He's just a guy we've kind of forgotten about that to me, again, going back to on paper, seems like he could be a great small ball five behind Pirtle and like I I could I can talk myself into like a 10 man rotation of a very competitive Spurs team you say the McDermott deal maybe is a question mark of like are we rebuilding are we just bringing in more veterans uh the Bryn Forbes one is more of that to me I can argue both sides of this like solid depth piece and or why in the world are you bringing this guy back let's let's play Josh Primo let's just give all the minutes to White and Murray and and not worry about you know giving Bryn Forbes more time on, on the court yeah, that's a good point. I think McDermott is probably more scalable to whatever direction they might choose. And the, the Bryn Forbes thing seemed pretty uh, instructive of, of what they're trying to do. But I look, you mentioned already the, the West is deep. And so if this team is under 500 near the trade deadline and in 
you know, 10th, 11th, 12th. Um, they're a candidate to sell. Look, they could, at this point, as soon as we're done with this podcast, they might be the team that trades for Ben Simmons, for all we know at this point. That's right. how, why not? The, the optionality here is, it is, it is wild. Yeah. Um, are there any other teams you wanted to shout out uh, to, to close that, you, that were your honorable mention? Uh, mysterious. I'll say for me, I'm going to give honorable mention to the Magic. I know okay. they're probably going to be bad, but I'm also intrigued. I feel like they got a couple young pieces. Like, I know Warriors fans are planning on Otto Porter to be good. If Otto Porter can be good, why not Gary Harris? Let's get Gary Harris back. Let's get some young rookies there. Let's get a Wendell Carter Jr. bounce back. Uh, but are there any other teams that you'd like to give an honorable mention to for your excited the about what I, they could be? Um, I don't know if I'm excited about what they could be, but the two teams I gave brief <laughs> consideration to it was Boston. I'm just not uh-huh. sure how it comes together offensively for them. And it also yeah. seems like they're going to play Al Horford and Robert Williams together. I don't know that I love that. Um, and they were play- like the Dennis Schroeder signing was great, but they did lose in theory, two of their best shot creators slash playmakers in Fournier and-, and Kemba Walker. So how does that look? And then the Knicks leaning all the way into shot creation over the off season. I understand the response given what happened in that Atlanta series, but you're now banking an awful lot that your defensive system or that your defensive success was a product of, of Tibbs and, you know, maybe your front court with Mitchell Robinson, Taj Gibson, Zerlin as well. You let your best perimeter defender go in Reggie Bullock. Um, I was just doing our Knicks look ahead at Hardwood Knox. And I think RJ Barrett is now just going to have to like cover the top perimeter options. And there was probably already a little bit of luck caked into their defensive success looking at opponent three point percentage last year. And so this team has kind of done a complete 180 on what it assumes its identity is going to be. And then of course there's the, the what is Kemba Walker right Mm. now, because we're not that far removed from Kemba Walker playing at an all-star level. The knees are scary, but so what did they land there? Uh, But yeah, ultimately Boston and New York, they, they fell by the wayside for me. Those are pretty good ones. Well, Dan, great insight, great content. Really appreciate you coming on. And I look forward to you uh, coming on again some other time. Most definitely. Always appreciate you having me on, Keith. Thanks. All right. See you, man. That was awesome. Take care. I'll talk to you soon. Uh, Do I say NOLA.com? Is that? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's just, uh, let's rock and roll. I'm joined right now by Christian Clark, a Pelicans beat writer for NOLA.com. Christian, you wrote an article, I believe it came out on Wednesday, describing some of the the dysfunction uh, in the Pelicans organization, some of the concerns about Zion Williamson, and also some stuff about David Griffin, including a particularly harrowing anecdote, which I found troubling. But anyway, uh, Christian, how are you? Thanks for coming on. Hey man, I'm I'm doing pretty good. What was the troubling anecdote? Most troubling anecdote. The most troubling anecdote. So I, if you don't know, and if our if our listeners don't know, I'm a professional piano player, and <laughs> there's a story in there where, in an attempt to bond with this rookie who who you know maybe they they weren't having the greatest relationship in the Orlando bubble, David Griffin invited Zion Williamson to come spend time with him, and then he played the piano for him. And I got to say, as a musician and as a human being, forcing playing piano on someone is not okay. It's not like you should not do that. Like you should never be like, hey, why don't you sit there? I'm going to play you something like that's not cool, man. Like, like you shouldn't do that. Uh, Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, it's funny that that's kind of the, the anecdote that every, everyone is ran with. I mean, that's by far the most reaction I've gotten on the piece in terms of just like the specifics, like people <laughs> for whatever reason, they're like, Oh, the piano, huh? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is akin to guy who brings a guitar to a party. Like that's all, that's already <laughs> at one level of crime. Like, like, what do you do? Like no one, like, you know, like you don't have this gift you have to share with people. Okay. Well, like, like, can I ask you a question as a piano player? So the guy who brings the guitar to a party, he's probably playing Wonderwall, right? Like what's the piano equivalent? Oh, of- that's a man. That's a, that's a, I don't even know what the piano equivalent is anymore. I, I, I like the Wonderwall. It's a very dated reference for you. And I enjoy it. That's, that's, that's definitely my, um, also kind of my age there. I assume some terrorists could show up and play wagon wheel or something on the guitar. Uh, now that's a great question. Like what is the piano song? Is it, 
Is there like an Adele song or something? I, like, I don't even know. That, that's an amazing question. Do you have any idea? I mean, in do have your sources revealed? Like, what did David Griffin play to Zion Williamson? Um, I I don't know what was played. Uh, I I guess I'll just leave it. I can't say. I, I just can't really was say it too a much cover? about it. Was it was it like a cover of a modern song? Like, like like was it a classical song? Was it a blues song? Or was he was he like, hey, uh, you you really like this artist? I've done a piano cover of this. That maybe well, we what can. I'm, what we I'm can hoping it was it is it wasn't just chopsticks. Like I feel like you can't come in there, you know, with like and play like the weakest stuff ever. Like da 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 da. Like you if you're gonna right. do that, you gotta like bring it right. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, again, if I were to, if I were the GM of an NBA team and if I were trying to relate to a 19 year old professional basketball player, there's nothing I could play. I mean, there's, there's literally like, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 it shook me to my core when I read it and I have made fun a lot of the Pelicans recently. And I, I, you know, I try to stoke the rivalry between the Grizzlies and the Pelicans, but this it's like, I don't need to do anything hands off. This team is tearing itself apart from the inside out. Um, look, uh, there wasn't that much pushback after the piece. Like, um, you know, we gave the team and David Griffin, like the chance to comment on the record about this stuff before it ran. So we didn't get a ton of pushback. But I mean, it's, when you just look at the past two and a half years, man, I mean, if you're just being objective, I mean, they had the Anthony Davis chip, which they could use to get back stuff. And they hit on 6% chance to get Zion. And like, this is what it looks like right now. And uh, you know, it can get better, but it, it's just not great right now. Is it, if they just win some games, will all this not matter? Like, will it all go away? Is that like the simple fix to just win some games this upcoming season? I mean, I think it's possible. Um, I, I think they're going to play hard for Willie Green. I mean, I think, you know, this, like, this all could have been fixed last year if you just, you know, get the right head coach in here. Um, I mean, like, I like Stan a lot. Uh, he's just not the right fit for this team. Uh, but it looks like, you know, they've, they've got the right idea at head coach now. So, I mean, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I mean, maybe too much has been done already. Too much has been uh, played. Well, there's a, there's a lot of talk about just how Zion himself is bringing a lot of baggage and he's not working out with the team and he's never shown up in shape and he's always a little bit hurt and he's kind of rubbed the wrong way. Like, I mean, how much of this is just on Zion? Like there's nothing the Pelicans could have done. Yeah. I mean, so, some of it is definitely on Zion. There's, there's no question. I mean, I think I personally put definitely put more of the blame on, on David Griffin uh, because, you know, he's supposed to be like the adult who's already won a championship and has experience like, leading a team um you know sure zion could have done some things better like yeah it would definitely help if he gave a crap on defense like it would definitely help if he put in the work you know when the lights weren't on i mean he plays really hard during the games but i don't know that he's like grinding to get his body into shape when they're not playing uh but it's also just hard to tell like a 21 year old who just averaged 27 a game on 61 percent shooting like hey man <laughs> right. can you do better i mean right right I wouldn't yeah <laughs> yeah no that's the funny question every time i read all this stuff about like zion's not working out you're like oh my god like he does that without <laughs> you know without preparation or something <laughs> like like can he roll out of bed and do this 27 points per game and you know m make all his shots essentially um it, it's, it's it's some incredible stuff and also with like the the, the pelicans roster moves this offseason i felt like it was i think most of the nba people outside of new orleans thought it was strange that like they got rid of of lonzo ball it seemed like that that was a good pairing and that they, they use picks to bring in Jonas Valanciunas to bring in Devonte Graham. The big question is, are, are they any better? I, I think most New Orleans people are saying, yes, I feel like everyone outside of New Orleans is saying like, that team seems like a train wreck. So what do you think? Did, did this team improve? Um, I mean, they were 31 and 41 last year. I think their like winning percentage or whatever will definitely, I, th I think it'll be better this year. Yeah. Um, I think, I think they've got a, I think there'll be a play in tournament team unless there's just like a catastrophic injury to one of the stars. Um, but like they, you know, they lost like 14 games last year uh, by three or fewer points. Like they had, a, they were awful in like those really close games. Like the vibes were just terrible. Like the two stars just didn't care about playing defense. Like Stan Van Gundy really could never fully get them there. So like, you know, if, if any or, or multiple of those things go the other way this year, then, you know, maybe there is a, a pretty big jump. So you talk about the defense from an outsider's perspective, 
as not great as Steven Adams and Eric Bledsoe were, those are thought of as defensive players. And then Lonzo Ball, I think, is a pretty decent defender. The guys they brought in, not really known for defense. I mean, Jonas for... He has a lot of offensive strengths, and he's a great defensive rebounder, which will help you, you know, get that defensive rating a little lower by cleaning the glass. But, like, it doesn't seem like the pieces they brought in, they seem like they're worse defenders than the guys who, who they sent out. So is it all on Willie Green to get, I guess, a buy-in from Brandon Ingram and Zion? I mean, yeah, I think that's that's probably, like, the biggest piece of the puzzle. Um, I, I, I honestly, I mean, I, I think they can be a really good offensive team. I mean, if they're like somewhere in the middle of the pack on defense, I think that's a huge win, you know, versus where they've been the last two years. Um, I will say though, I think Lonzo Ball's a really good defender, like not on the ball. I don't know that he's like right. that great of a defender right on the ball. And I think Eric Bledsoe, I think he was just kind of mentally checked out last year. I mean, I think there was like last year was a lot of like a lot of these guys are just like, mm, you know, I don't, I don't really want to be here right now, you know, <laughs> yeah. for a variety of reasons. Yeah, I mean, as as a Grizzlies fan, is is it okay for me to be optimistic that uh, Stephen Adams will have a, a bounce back? He'll, he'll maybe like the the situation a little bit more. He'll, he'll enjoy catching passes from John Moran, and maybe it wasn't all just age and the the I don't know the treads come off the tire for him. Yeah, oh, I would. I mean, if I was a Grizzlies fan, I would be feeling really optimistic about it. Um, I think. I mean, it's just a much better basketball fit, and I don't know. I don't know that that Stephen Adams like really enjoyed like uh, Stan Van Gundy's um, very vigorous drill sergeanty coaching. I don't know that he loved that. Um, so I imagine you know Taylor Jenkins isn't going to be sitting there like you know putting them through three hour practices or anything like yeah. that. But I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I'm not in, entirely sure about the inner workings there. Well, yeah. the big comparison between the Pelicans and the Grizzlies, they're obviously connected between the the Zion Williamson going first and then John Morant going second. Those guys, you know, both from South Carolina, they're, they're good buddies. Is this too controversial for you to answer after two seasons? Like, who would you rather have? Because I, I read these things about Zion, and I definitely wish the Grizzlies got the first pick back at the time, but now I'm like, I feel like we might have dodged a bullet by ending up with John Morant, so... Going forward, would you rather have Zion or Ja? Yeah, I think this question really comes down to: Do you believe Zion is gonna, uh, you know, eventually like be really, really serious about you know maintaining his body, like getting on a really good diet, like really putting the work in before the games? Um, because you know he just has such a unique body type that I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that you can stay healthy if you're not taking all these steps kind of behind the scenes. So that's to me what it comes down to. And I think that he will eventually. I mean, he's just so young. I think, you know, it, it's just kind of been like a weird last five, six years. Like he was like a nobody his freshman year of high school. And then like Drake is like, oh my God, Zion Williamson on Instagram is like the best dunker ever. And then is one of the greatest college seasons of all time. So I think, you know, Zion's, Zion's got to sit here and go like, hey, what I've accomplished is incredible. But like, if I really want to get where I want to go, I got to start doing this stuff. And uh, I, I think I believe that he will eventually. All right. Well, Christian, thanks so much for coming on. Everybody out there, go check out your piece at NOLA.com about David Griffin trapping a poor young man in a room and playing the piano for him against his will. No one do that. Musicians don't do that. It's not the way to ingratiate yourself. Anyway, Christian, appreciate you coming on. Uh, look forward to talking to you again sometime. Thanks, man.